Hi everybody and welcome back to Language and Communication with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. Today's lecture is going to be fairly light in terms of the content we discuss. We're just going to begin making our way into the textbook by discussing the first chapter of the book, uh, as well as a little bit of the work of uh, Gottlob Frege, who was an important logician um, and philosopher who did a lot of work to kind of uh, get the ball rolling when it comes to the subject matter of the next couple lectures, which is theories of meaning and reference. But before we get to the actual details that I'm going to be talking about today, um, I just want to let everybody know um, that, uh, well, let me, let me preface this. Um, I've been getting a lot of messages. Students are worried um, that quiz dates are, are changing and uh, students are wondering what material is going to be on the quiz, what the lecture schedule will be like. Um, uh, I just want to say to everybody, don't worry. We're going to sort everything out schedule-wise, and um, we will make it through this. I will not offer you a quiz or an assignment on any material that I have not lectured on yet. Um, the reason is uh, largely to do with the fact that the readings for this class are difficult. Um, Frege, the paper that I'll be talking a little bit about today, his writing is uh, a little difficult to get through, I understand. And the textbook we're using is also a little bit difficult to understand at times. That's all right. Um, so I'm not, I'm not ever going to quiz you or test you or ask you to complete an assignment unless I've lectured on the material first, so don't worry about that. And when it comes to scheduling, um, I think, fingers crossed, I can get us caught up next week. Um, however, I realize that some of you also... Um, you know, some of you work and may have requested days off for a live lecture here or a quiz there. Um, so if there are any scheduling conflicts, come and talk to me. I will be accommodating not just in cases of illness or bereavement, but also in cases of schedule conflicts like this. So um, don't be afraid to approach me. Don't worry. I'm not going to be extra hard on you or unsympathetic. Um, this, is, this is a hectic time for everybody. COVID-19 obviously doesn't make things any easier, but we will all get through this material together, and uh, we're all going to learn some very interesting things as we do so about language and communication. And I have to say, this area is not my speciality, but it is an area of interest for me, as I mentioned before, because of the intersection between language and philosophy of mind. Philosophy of mind is what I'm really interested in. All right. So, um, what are we going to talk about today? Well, today I want to talk a little bit about Frege and I'll, whoops, what was that? Um, so, what are we going to talk about today? Well, um, I want to talk a little bit about Frege because uh, Frege is mentioned quite a bit in these, uh, well, maybe not chapter one, uh, but in chapters two and three, Frege is uh, discussed quite a bit. So I'll give you a little bit of background on Frege, and uh, we're going to go over these four puzzles um, that are kind of like a recurring theme through the next couple lectures and through these three chapters of the textbook. Uh, essentially, um, you can find the material I'm going to be covering in this lecture on the PDF I uploaded of your slides to see you learn. I'm only going to cover slides 1 to 14 today. Um, and this will be largely just to kind of get us caught up. It's not going to be an intense lecture, and um, we'll tackle the real meat and potatoes in the following lecture, which will cover chapters two and three. I may add some extra explanatory detail here and there, or gloss over a few things and save them for next time. Uh, so I do recommend that you take notes. Um, I actually recommend that you print out the slides and that you take notes uh, on those uh, printouts. Um, that will be to your benefit. Um, speaking of that, uh, we do need a volunteer note taker in this class. So if anyone is interested in doing that, um, you will have to contact uh, volunteer note taking services or the Paul Menton Center. But if one of you would like to volunteer to share your notes with the volunteer note taking, so that they can be uh, in turn shared with students who need access to notes. That would be super, and you would have my gratitude 
um, as well as uh, whomever ends up using your notes for studying, I'm sure. So, yes, if we have any volunteer note takers, uh, let me know or get in touch with note taking services. Anyhow, um, right, well, let's get into these uh, slides and readings. Let's get into the material a little bit now. So I'll try my best to remember to indicate the number of the slide that I'm on so that if you are listening or watching and you also have the slides open, you can follow along with me. So we've got a kind of outline for the next two lectures on slide number two. Again, uh, this is meant to cover Lacan chapters one to three. Now, uh, what we want to do here, or rather what I am tasked with, is getting you up to speed on something called the referential theory of meaning. This is, well, what it sounds like. It's a theory of meaning, a theory of how words or whole sentences have the meaning that they do. I'll get into this a little more when I start discussing chapter one of the textbook. But referential theory of meaning is a particular theory, uh, theory of meaning that, refer, that uh, accounts for where uh, whole sentences or parts of sentences, i.e. words, get their meaning from. Um, <clears throat> then, uh, we probably won't get to this today, but we're going to talk a little bit about definite descriptions. Definite descriptions are things like uh, the Queen of England or the King of France. Uh, this is something that features heavily in Bertrand Russell's philosophy of language. His paper on denoting is very famous, uh, and in this he tried to show that proper names are really just definite descriptions. Definite descriptions are descriptions that are uh, preceded by the word the, the definite article the. Um, but again, uh, don't worry about that too much now. We'll get into that more later. Um, so, um, we're going to take a look at these four classic logical puzzles that uh, figures like Russell and Frege have tried to address with their work, among others. Um, and we'll start looking at um, different ways we can analyze the structure of sentences as well. We can talk about grammatical structure and we can talk about logical structure. These are actually two different things. Um, finally, once we get towards the end of chapter three, uh, we'll be considering some objectives, uh, objections and responses to Bertrand Russell's theory of descriptions. Uh, so we'll be focusing on some work from Galen Strawson, uh, one from Donnellan, and another from Saul Kripke. Um, so, uh, some, fair, some fairly heavy hitters here. Uh, lots of stuff to talk about. All right, so moving on to slide three, um, you've already had the chance to kind of Get your feet wet, as it were, uh, thanks to Will's excellent lectures on the paper by Noam Chomsky and the other paper by Donald Davidson. These are two really big figures. Uh, Dr. Wayne calls them pivotal figures in her slides here. Um, pivotal, influential, very important, I dare say monumental in linguistics and the philosophy of language, because these figures um, help to create and develop the study of language as we see it today. Um, you've, already, uh, you've already encountered Chomsky and Davidson. Chomsky, of course, is the founder of modern linguistics, a figure who was important in what we call the cognitive revolution, which is when the discipline known as cognitive science began to emerge and come into its own. This is, by the way, my own discipline, my PhD is in cognitive science, so Chomsky is someone I'm not super familiar with, but reasonably competent at discussing, I think. But anyway, Chomsky is important because of his notions of universal grammar, his idea that language is innate, and his responses to behaviorist, account of, uh, behaviorist accounts of language, which will discuss very well in his lectures. Of course, you've also read Davidson's paper, A Nice Derangement of Epitaphs. Um, admittedly, this one was tough for me to get through. Uh, I had not read this paper before. Found Davidson's style a little bit esoteric. It wasn't until I learned uh, a bit more about his background that I was able to crack uh, what he was talking about. But his main, uh, his main idea, the main idea he tries to convey in that paper is that there is no such thing as a language as we understand it, 
right? We understand uh, language as this kind of, I don't know, body of knowledge, um, how to use certain signs and symbols and uh, how to manipulate these symbols, the rules by which we can transform sentences, uh, respond to sentences. I mean, Chomsky thinks of language as very computational, right? Um, Davidson disagrees with that. Davidson says, no, well, we, we each kind of come to, um, come together with a kind of prior theory of language, but that's not how communication happens. Really, we modify our prior theories into a passing theory, and if our passing theories converge, then communication is successful. So there isn't this uh, innate universal grammar uh, that allows us to uh, learn the, 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 learn how to use natural languages. Um, and there isn't even that kind of a body of knowledge, according to Davidson, at least as far as I understand him. Instead, um, language is really shaped, uh, by the context a lot more than someone like Chomsky would, would say. Um, Frege. Well, I'll talk about Frege in a moment, uh, but uh, for now, um, just know that the central questions of figures like Frege, as well as Chomsky and Davidson, are all focused on, you know, the fundamentals of language or understanding what language is and what it does. For example, um, the questions thinkers like these ask concern the fundamental nature and fundamental functions of language. You know, is, is language innate? Is language something we learn or is it something we acquire or grow into, right? This is what Chomsky asks. Um, if the function of language is to communicate, well, how does successful communication come about? Uh, Davidson has some of his own very interesting ideas, which he discusses in his paper, that communication occurs when two speakers passing theories successfully converge. So, um, another important thing, and this is what we'll get into with Frege and Russell and figures like this, is the relationship between language and the truth. We'll also see a little bit of this in uh, chapter one of the textbook. Um, of course, um, something else on slide three here that, uh, well, Dr. Wayne has put very well is the meaning of meaning. What is meaning and how do words come to have it? These are questions, I mean, we, the things that these questions are trying to get at, we often take for granted, right? We're very strange creatures, aren't we? we? We're the only creatures we know of in this whole universe that use natural language to communicate, and we're very skilled at it. Um, we have brains that seem to have evolved in order to do this, and yet we take for granted so much of how language actually works. You can use words to refer to things. You understand that words have meaning, and you can use this knowledge to successfully communicate with people all the time. But if I were to ask you what meaning is, or how words come to have that meaning, would you be able to answer that? Probably not without thinking about it for a little bit. And even then, you might find that what you thought was wrong, as we'll see when we discuss the referential theory of language. And of course, uh, the relationship between language and communication. These are not the same thing, and this is something that I think Chomsky raises in his work. Um, communication, I mean, all creatures communicate, whether all creatures have language, which, if you're coming at this from a kind of Chomskyan perspective, is an innate ability, um, uh, a universal grammar, something that tells you how you can legitimately compose sentences or change sentences while preserving meaning or, or what have you, um, you know, the rules of transformational grammar, basically. Um, we're the only creatures that seem to do anything like that. Um, granted, some great apes have been taught to communicate with sign language. Um, their abilities are nowhere near what those of uh, even a human child is. And although some might argue that other higher mammals like cetaceans, for example, whales and dolphins, may use something like a language or, or that it, at least lang is language-like, um, we cannot communicate with them. We, we don't know, right? As far as we know, we're the only creature that, that uses language to communicate. 
One thing I want to point out before we get too deep into this is this uh, difference between using a word and mentioning a word. Um, because I'm going to be doing that. Uh, mentioning words versus using words, uh, air quotes, this kind of thing. So I want you to be mindful of the difference. Um, when I use a word to refer to something, well, I'm doing exactly that. I'm using the word. If I use the word the morning star to refer to the planet Venus, I'm using the words the morning star. So if I, a better, a clearer way to say this would be um, if I'm uttering the words that's the morning star, um, then I'm uttering them and I'm using them to refer to the planet Venus. So this is contrasted with mentioning a word. If I utter a word to, you know, talk about the word itself and not what the word is actually used for or what the word picks out, um, I am mentioning the word. So for example, if I say to you, um, this pizza is delicious, then I'm using the word pizza to refer to this delicious pizza that I wish I were eating right now. Um, if I'm mentioning the word pizza, what I'm doing is talking about the word pizza, not pizza itself. I might be talking about, you know, the etymology of the word pizza, uh, something like that. That's the difference between using a word and mentioning a word. And that will be important to keep in mind as we talk about Frege. All right, so let's get into it now. Okay, so before we get into the first chapter of the textbook, it would be wise to discuss the work of Gottlob Frege, who was a German mathematician and logician. So a philosopher in mathematician's clothing, if you will. Gottlob Frege is really important. He is regarded as the founder of analytic philosophy. Sometimes uh, ana the analytic tradition is called the Anglo-American tradition, but that's not entirely accurate. The Anglo-American tradition is often contrasted with the continental tradition. But Frege was from the continent, um, as was another noteworthy figure in the study of language and communication, Ludwig Wittgenstein. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. So, Frege was a logician. He invented modern logic, uh, you know, the predicate calculus, this kind of thing. Uh, prior to this, um, well, Aristotelian logic was the predominant um, way in which philosophers made use of logic. So Frege really upped the game when it came to logic. Um, he also spent a lot of time talking about um, what it is, uh, what it is uh, that, well, the, the question of meaning. Um, Frege pondered this a lot. Oh, I've just committed an error. So I just pronounced Gottlob Frege's name as Freg. Um, that is not how we pronounce his name. Uh, as I was reminded by one of my old colleagues in graduate school, um, uh, a big fellow who um, was a weightlifter and very into analytic philosophy, had this big deep voice like this, um, and we were just shooting the breeze one day and he said, oh, what are you doing in, uh, in your class uh, for your TA duties? I said, oh, I'm having the students read a little bit of Freg. No, Frege, not Freg. Frega. So, oh, it's Frega. Okay. All right. Let's continue. <clears throat> so, Frege was really interested in meaning, and his paper, Über Sinn und Bedeutung, or On Sense and Reference, is really, really important. It's hard to understate the importance of Frege's work here. Um, and I'm not going to try and explain all of the ideas in that paper exhaustively to you right now. This is the kind of paper which uh, requires more than one reading. That said, if you've tried reading it and you're uh, just at a loss, I suggest you put it down and forget about it and just follow this lecture. Or, if you're feeling ambitious, take another look at Frege's paper after you've listened to this lecture, because I'm going to try and draw your attention to the important parts of his theory in the same way that Will drew your attention to some important features in Chomsky's work and in Davidson's work. Okay, so what is Frege known for? 
Frege is known for his distinction between sense and reference. What is sense and what is reference? Well, the reference or referent of a term, say the moon, uh, the word the moon, is what the word is referring to, right? This is a simple example, by the way. It actually gets a little bit more complicated than this in Frege. But basically, we have the referent, which is what the word refers to, or perhaps what the sentence refers to. And we also have the sense. The sense is the uh, quote-unquote mode of presentation of the referent. The same referent can have uh, different modes of presentation, and sometimes there can be a sense, i.e. a mode of presentation, without a referent. For example, if I say um, Daenerys Targaryen's dragons uh, um, were, were badass. <clears throat> no, sorry. So if I say Daenerys Targaryen's dragons were badass, um, well, I'm referring to three fictional dragons, right? There's no actual referent for these dragons. But there is a sense um, which is not to be associated with the what it's like to have this uh, mental image conjured up by my saying Daenerys Targaryen's dragons are badass. Um, that's actually something different, which I'll talk about in a moment. But the sense is the mode of presentation, but in this case you can have a sense. I could say Daenerys Targaryen's dragons are badass, or I could say uh, the mother of dragons, um, dragons are very impressive and awe-inspiring, right? There's a number of ways I could describe the badassery of Daenerys Targaryen's dragons. Um, none, nonetheless, there are no dragons, right? There's no referent for that sentence to pick out, but there is a sense that that sentence carries, right? So, um, mode of uh, presentation refers to sense. Um, and it's contained, well, Frege says, within the sense of the sign. So let me see if I can clarify this with Frege's uh, example. And this is the example that we usually find uh, when we talk about this stuff, is that, um, you know, um, the referent of the evening star is the planet Venus. Um, but so is the referent of the morning star. And sometimes we use other terms, Hesphorus and Phosphorus, right? Um, the morning star, the evening star, whatever. They each have the same referent, uh, the planet Venus. But uh, they're different modes of presentation. They're different senses in which I can talk about the planet Venus, right? So that's the difference between sense and reference for Frege. Um, a sense is a mode of presentation. The reference, uh, well, the referent is what the sign we're talking about refers to. So the sense is kind of um, contained within the sense of the sign, but the referent is not. The sign picks out the referent, if you follow me, okay? Now, um, there's something to differentiate here uh, that Frege calls the associated conception. Um, this is subjective. Mode of presentation or sense is not subjective. And this is an easy mistake to make because we often use the word sense, sense, in a kind of colloquial way, uh, at least when we're using it in our everyday parlance, we use the word sense to refer to things that are subjective my sense of feeling um, apprehensive at having to teach Frege to all of you, for example, or my sense that it's warm outside right now. This is subjective, right? Sense in, uh, in, in the way that Frege is talking about is not subjective. It is objective, an objective mode of presentation. But what is subjective is the associated conception that is evoked uh, when I use words to convey senses and pick out reference, okay? So, um, the example that I really like um, 
that Frege uses to spell this out in his paper is that of a telescope. So imagine the telescope uh, looking at the moon. All right, so we've got our moon. That's the referent. Okay, easy. We've got two other things to sort out, though. We have our sense and we have our um, subjective, um, our uh, subjective associated conception. The moon is the referent. The telescope is the mode of presentation. And Frege makes this point uh, really well, I think, um, that uh, how um, modes of presentation can differ. Um, we could have a series of telescopes all pointed at the moon at the same time and place on the planet Earth. Um, now, it's the same referent, but each telescope is going to produce a different image on one's retina, a different sense, um, even if they're all right beside one another pointed at the same object, right? So the telescope in this analogy is the sense. The uh, associated conception is one's experience. That is what is subjective, one's experience of the moon. So very important. The, the mode of presentation, the sense, is not subjective, but the associated conception, that is the conception associated with a particular sense, is subjective, okay? All right. So in a good part of this paper, Frege is talking about proper names. Um, you know, like Josh Redstone is a proper name, right? Um, whereas uh, the Queen of England is a definite description, right? Um, or maybe a better example, you know, Elizabeth Windsor is a proper name. Uh, the Queen of England is a definite description. So that's another distinction that it's helpful to keep in mind. Um, so he's talking for, um, well, a good while through this paper about proper names. He says on, let's see, page 31, I think, refers to page 31 of the original text, untranslated, which is given in the margins of the reading I shared with all of you. He says, a proper name, a word, a sign, sign combination or expression, expresses its sense, refers to or designates or denotes its referent. By means of a sign, we express its sense and designate its referent. Okay, so that's how proper names work. We pick out or refer to something, a person, say, um, but we convey a sense at the same time. And this can explain the difference uh, in terms of cognitive value of like identity statements, which we'll get into in a moment. This is how Frege starts the paper off, which I think catches a lot of people, uh, throws a lot of people through a loop. Frege really hits the ground running. Um, oh, I've done it again. Frege really hits the ground running in this paper. Um, but in any case, when he's talking about, um, you know, assuming that, um, you know, A equals A is true, for example, um, and B is equal to A, or B is A, B is another word for A, then A equals B must also be true. So that's true, but uh, people, um, you know, it has, that each statement has a different cognitive significance to people. It's kind of like if I, uh, talk to you about, um, you know, Heisenberg versus Walter White, right? Those two words have the same reference, but they have a different sense. And that's how Frege explains uh, this difference in uh, cognitive value between statements like A equals A and A equals B. A equals A is a priori true, but A equals B um, may be true, but we need some kind of empirical a posteriori reason for thinking so. So anyway, um, uh, Frege moves on from proper names, starts to move to declarative sentences that contain entire thoughts. Um, getting back to this idea of cognitive sentence, uh, cognitive significance, I mean, just consider these two uh, sentences, for example. Uh, the evening star is a body illuminated by the sun. Okay. Say you believe that sentence, uh, and then I say to you, um, the morning star is a body illuminated by the sun. Is it necessarily true that you believe the second statement if you believe the first? Well, it's not immediately apparent um, that you should believe the second statement if you believe the first. And that's because of the different mode of presentation here um, by the words that we're using. 
right? This explains this cognitive significance. So you might believe one sentence to be true and one to be false, even though, according to Frege, and this is getting quite deep into the, the nuts and bolts of his article, both sentences really have the same referent, and that is to the true. Um, what Frege is ultimately talking about are not particular objects in the world here, but truth values. Uh, truth value can have the value of either being true or false. In this case, the evening star is a body illuminated by the sun is a true statement. Um, so this sentence refers to the true, right? So we'll get into this in uh, more detail when we start talking about these four classic puzzles uh, in the philosophy of language. But uh, this is just to, um, you know, try to get you up to speed with Frege. Okay, uh, talking about proper names, uh, well, as I already mentioned, um, names can um, have uh, no referent but contain thoughts, right? Uh, and they can still have a sense. We went over this with uh, the example of Daenerys Targaryen's dragons. Um, Odysseus is the example that um, uh, Frege uses in the paper. You know, Odysseus was set ashore at Ithaca, has a sense, and is associated with thought or, um, you know, conception, but probably no referent. So, that's interesting. So, Frege is saying something like, what truth value is to reference, remember, the referent of, of all sentences is, is, is to their truth value, which can either be true or false. So truth value is to reference as thought is to sense. Um, and since the truth value of a sentence concerns its referent, right? I mean, that's, that's important uh, because whether the sentence is true or false is going to depend on the state of affairs in the world that it's trying to point at or trying to pick out, right? Um, so whether, um, since the truth value of a sentence concerns its referent in that way, the truth value cannot change if the referent doesn't change, even if the sense changes, right? So even if I swap the morning star as a body illuminated by the sun for the evening star as a body illuminated by the sun, those sentences are still both true. So they both still reference the true, even though they still have different senses, um, so we can, we can substitute different words and not change the truth value, even though the thought, which is, um, associated with sense, um, uh, even though the, the, the sense can change, right? Uh, the sense can change thereby changing the thought, but the truth value and the referent don't change even when we change words. And it's in these ways that sense and reference kind of can be differentiated from one another. That's what Frege is trying to do in this paper. Now, um, what are the most confusing elements of this paper? Well, if you're not confused by the idea of sense and reference, good. Um, the confusing bit tends to be this idea that I just kind of finished with, that um, the, um, you know, the referent is, is the truth value of a sentence. Um, that's pretty abstract, and Frege, I mean, reading his paper, it's almost like it's a little bit esoteric in the sense that if you don't have background in logic that Frege does, it can be a little bit tough to comprehend what he's saying. But I just wanted to lay all of these ideas out there for all of you. We're going to talk about them more and more in what follows, the remainder of this lecture and in the next lecture. So if you don't immediately grasp what Frege is saying, don't panic. I think you will come to understand what Frege is saying the more you reflect on these ideas and the more you think about them. So, um... That is what I want to say about Frege for now. Uh, why don't we get back to the slides and uh, we'll power our way through to slide number 14, uh, through chapter 1 of this textbook. Okay, so I think by now we should have a good grasp of what Chomsky, Davidson, and Frege are all interested in doing when it comes to language. Frege wants to understand... Um, you know, this distinction between sense and reference, as well as how language is connected to the truth, right? Um, 
how how are words uh, connected to what is true? Um, Chomsky, on the other hand, um, is very empirically informed. He's very scientific uh, in terms of what he does, and he wants to ground the study of language in the human brain, which I think he has arguably very successfully done, if you know the history of philosophy of language, modern linguistics, and cognitive science. Um, so, um, and Davidson rejects a traditional view of language. Davidson would reject a lot of Chomsky's ideas about language. Um, he thinks that this pervasive incorrect usage of language in cases like malapropism show us that communication actually works a very different way. But of course, that was all discussed in Will's lectures. So if you have any questions, um, you know, you can ask me. Uh, if you have questions about Frege, let me know. Or, or uh, you know, if you need to refresh your memory of Chomsky or Donald Davidson, go check out Will's lectures again. Okay. <clears throat> so we've been talking about meaning, right? Uh, meaning is very important. Meaning is... Well, what makes language interesting and why it, it's why we want to study it. We want to know how we can convey meaningful th things, uh, how we can say things mean things, and how we can communicate meaning to one another using language. Uh, again, we're the only species that does this, so far as we know. Um, so this is fascinating stuff. Now, um, we can distinguish um, between different kinds of expressions right, on the basis of their being meaningful or not meaningful in the first place. Um, but it's more difficult than you might think to explain why certain expressions are meaningful uh, and certain expressions are not meaningful. So in, uh, in, uh, in the textbook, for example, on pages two and three, uh, Lacan gives us um, uh, a kind of a series of uh, strings, some of which are meaningful and some of which are not meaningful, right? Uh, and not just strings, but uh, sometimes um, whole sentences. Let me see if I can uh, go back here and just find them real quick. Um, okay. So, oh, this is a really good example. Um, so, uh, Lacan, in his text... Um, you know, offers uh, this example of why meaning and understanding is, is so interesting, right? Um, I'll quote from him here. Um, Not many people know that in 1931, Adolf Hitler made a visit to the United States, in the course of which he did some sightseeing, had a brief affair with a lady named Maxine in Keokuk, Iowa, tried peyote, uh, which caused him to hallucinate hordes of frogs and toads wearing little boots and singing the uh, Horst uh, Veselied. Uh, he infiltrated a munitions plant near Detroit, met secretly with Vice President Curtis regarding sealskin futures, and invented the electric can opener. <laughs> so, um, Lacan says there's a good reason why not many people know this story, is that it's not true. So, um, you know, a moment ago when I was talking about Frege, I was saying how all sentences uh, or all, you know, all, um, all reference pick out a truth value, true or false, um, or specifically the true. Uh, notice how this sentence does not do that. This sentence is entirely false. Adolf Hitler never did any of these things. And yet, the sentence still means something. You still understood it. So... Just let that digest for a little bit. You can still understand the meaning of a false sentence. Interesting. How does that work? This is the kind of thing we want to explain when we explain meaning. If we hop over to pages two and three, we can see some other strings. Like string number two is just a meaningless string of letters, right? It doesn't mean anything. String number three, however, it's dangerous to splash gasoline around your living room does mean something. It means that it's dangerous to splash gasoline around your living room. So it means something, but it means it differently than the first example does uh, with Hitler. Um, this is true. The sentences describing Hitler's adventures in the United States are false. And finally, we have string number four. Good of, off, primly, the, ah, uh, the, the, why. Um, okay, that doesn't mean anything either. 
But it's meaningless in a different way than string number two is meaningless. The individual words could still have some meaning if they were maybe arranged differently, or maybe if we added some other words. Um, but these individual words, we can still understand those, unlike this random string of letters in string number two that makes absolutely no sense. So why do some of these sentences have the meaning that they do, even when they're false or when they're true? How can we explain how they have meaning? Ah, this is the whole point behind philosophy of language, especially in the analytic tradition. Now, um, let's go back to um, So what we're going to do um, a little bit today, and, and mostly in the next lecture, is trying to understand um, meaning as reference to something, as we, we did with Frege, right? What a word means or what a sentence means is what it refers to or picks out, which is always the, the truth value of true, the, the truth. Um, so one way to do this is to talk about the referential theory of meaning which is to say that expressions derive their meaning from the objects of their reference. Another way of saying that is that words have their meaning by virtue of, uh, uh, of the fact that they pick out things in the world. Uh, this is a very old idea. It actually goes back to uh, John Stuart Mill in the early to mid-1800s, this theory of direct reference it's sometimes called. So um, this is old, but it... Uh, there, there are problems with it. There are these four puzzles, four logical puzzles that kind of arise in this referential theory of meaning. Um, and throughout today and the next lecture, we'll be talking about how to address these puzzles through the work of Frege and Russell and thinkers like that, right? So um, words are meaningful according to the referential theory of meaning because they refer to or denote, that's a technical term in this class, so be mindful of that, words denote things in the world. They pick out or refer to these things in the world. So a proper name, like Adolf Hitler or Elizabeth Windsor, um, names an individual in the world. So they stand for individuals in the world. But generic words like dog, or in other languages, chien in French or hund in German, they stand for groups of things in the world, right? So you might think that, what, what, what's wrong with the referential theory of meaning? Certainly nothing. Um, this is a very intuitive um, account of, of meaning, right? Um, maybe when I posed the question earlier, you know, have you ever thought about how language works and could you explain it? You might have thought of something like the referential theory of meaning. Words have meaning uh, because they refer to things in the world. But there are some problems with this. Um, they appear quickly, and if you think about it, um, or if you've read chapter one, a few uh, jump right to mind. I mean, there are some words that don't seem to refer to objects at all. They refer to maybe what we might call characteristics or properties instead. Um, I think the example in the book is Ralph is fat, right? Does that mean Ralph has the property of fatness? Um, what does it mean to be fat? Um, uh, fatness isn't like a thing we can point to in the same way that Ralph is a person we can point to. There are also other uh, curious nouns, like, um, you know, another example that's used in the book is, you know, for somebody's sake or on someone's behalf. A sake or a behalf is not something led around on a leash, the author uh like Han points out in the textbook. Um, and there are other words too, like is, right? Which is a copula, which uh, helps join uh, parts of sentences together. You know, the, the cat is on the mat, for example. The cat refers to the cat. The mat refers to the mat. But what does is do? Is isn't a thing in the world. It's a relationship between, you know, that that is is and on. Is on the mat is a relation that, we can maybe point to in the world. But in any case, the point I'm trying to make here is that, uh, you know, the referential theory of meaning uh, has some problems with it. Um, 
Some initial eject, uh, objections that Dr. Wayne has highlighted in these slides are that not all words actually stand for some actually existing thing. And that's kind of what I was just gesturing at, right? Um, another is that sentences can't just be lists of names, right? If words pick out, if, if words always refer to something in the world, then all words would work like names. But sentences aren't just lists of names, right? We have words like is, which is not a name. It might describe a property or help us to describe a property or a relationship between two named things like a cat or a mat, but it's not a name. Um, so there's got to be more to meaning than just reference, than what words pick out, right? I mean, of course, we also have words for non-existent things, too. I think I've already kind of made this point, but, you know, I can say to you, you know, I can use a proper noun for a non-existent entity, like Santa Claus, you know. Um, you'll still know what I'm talking about, uh, even though there is no Santa Claus to denote, right? Um, so, uh, there's also pronouns, uh, like no one. Um, that doesn't really refer to any anyone. No one doesn't refer to anyone. So, no one can't be a name. Uh, unless one decides to use it as a name, as some poets might do playfully. Uh, like, for example, Lewis Carroll, who was also a logician, by the way. Anyway, um, so, um, certain pronouns, certain non-existent individuals, uh, things we've already covered, predicates like fat, right? Ralph is fat. Well, um, what it stands for is not clear. I need to add additional words to make sense, uh, you know, or to, to attach this property to another entity in the world, like Ralph, right, for that to make sense. Um, but yeah, most interestingly, there's more to meaning than just reference. Um, two terms can refer to the same thing, but they can differ in meaning, as we've already said, right? Uh, they can differ, uh, if not in meaning, then in terms of cognitive significance. Um, and this is, um, this is what Frege is trying to show with his work on sense and reference, right? Two words can refer to the same thing, but they don't necessarily have the same meaning. They have the same uh, referent, but they have a different mode of presentation. And the mode of presentation uh, is connected to the thought, right? Or the subjective conception in the same way that the referent is connected to the truth value of a whole sentence or, or a word or a part of a sentence, right? So that's why morning star and evening star or Hesperus and Phosphorus, uh, for example, have different meanings. They have the same referent but different meanings and this can help to explain the difference in cognitive significance uh, that I just mentioned. Okay, I'm just going to talk uh, a little bit about definite descriptions uh, for a bit, um, because this is kind of where our four puzzles show up in the text and, well, in the philosophical analysis of language overall. Okay, so we've got this theory of definite descriptions, or, well, that's later, that's Russell, but what is a definite description? I've already kind of given you an answer, and that's that Definite descriptions uh, usually are accompanied by the word the in front. So a singular term, Lacan defines, as terms that purport to refer to single individuals, such as proper names, pronouns, and definite descriptions. Remember, a proper name would be Elizabeth Windsor. A definite description um, would be uh, the Queen of England. And a pronoun might be something like her majesty, okay? So, uh, singular terms are opposed to general terms. Um, singular terms refer to individual things, places, objects. Uh, general terms refer to types of things, like uh, here in my notes I've got red or car. Um, so let's say we've got some proper names like Bobbles, Canada, um, definite description, again, the, the Queen of England. The cat on the mat is a definite description, if I'm, you know, not just using it as an example, but referring to a particular cat on a particular mat. Um, there are some cats around here somewhere, 
Um, uh, maybe one will uh, maybe one will join us at some point for our lectures. Um, so yeah, singular person pronouns more specifically are you, she, he. Um, I would argue that uh, they. Um, counts. Um, some sticklers would disagree. Um, they is a, they is plural, but they has been, they, the word they, here I'm, see, I'm mentioning they rather than using the word they. Uh, the word they has been used in a singular pronoun, if I'm not mistaken, going back to at least the 17th century. Um, and although you may have uh, heard in high school English classes that they is a plural, um, is, is supposed to be plural, uh, there's no problem with using it singularly. And indeed, nowadays, uh, for example, it is used as a personal pronoun for, uh, for example, non-binary people. Um, so uh, there's no problem there, although some, some uh, not linguists might have you think that it doesn't make sense to use language that way. Um, it's fine. Uh, don't worry about it. They can be a singular pronoun. But you, he, she, uh, I, they are all singular pronouns too. And of course we have demonstrative pronouns like this or that, which we use for, you know, inanimate objects and things like, you know, like, uh, this camera, this window, this piece of modern art, right? Stuff like that. So, um... The motivating question here, what is it? Well, um, does the referential theory of meaning hold up when it comes to singular terms? Well, we've seen we've got a few different kinds of singular terms here. Um, definite descriptions are a type of singular term, and according to Frege and Bertrand Russell, um, they, don't they don't have their meanings captured by reference alone. Frege would say there also has to be a sense there. Um, Russell offers um, a theory of definite descriptions, um, but, um, you know, if we, if we, without getting ahead of ourselves, if we just look at, um, if we just restrict our focus to the referential theory of language, um, then when it comes to a theory of meaning for definite descriptions, we get some logical puzzles that we have to contend with. So, here are the puzzles, basically. Um, definite descriptions uh, don't derive their meaning from what they denote, and uh, we know that because if they did, we would have to contend with these problems. One is the problem of apparent reference to non-existence. One is the problem of negative existentials. Another is Frege's uh, puzzle about identity. And another is called the problem of substitutivity. Now, we won't get through all of these in super great detail today, but I'd at least like to outline them for you. So. Uh, let's see. Uh, what is problem one? The problem of apparent reference to non-existence. So if you want to follow along here, you can do so by reading on page 10 and 11 for this first problem, the problem of apparent reference to non-existence. And this is the problem of meaning uh, when we're using um, words to refer to things that don't exist. The example in the textbook on page 10 is a sentence that reads, James Moriarty is bald, James Moriarty being the antagonist from uh, the uh, story The Final Problem where Sherlock Holmes has his showdown with James Moriarty at the Reichenbach waterfall. Um, all right, so the following set of statements, according to Lycan, um, is inconsistent. So these statements, uh, let's start over. So these are all statements that describe that sentence, and they can't all be true. So we've got a contradiction here, and this is why there's um, this is why there's a problem. This is what this problem is. So let's go through these characteristics one by one. So one is a meaningful, significant, non-meaningless. One is a subject-predicate sentence. Okay. 
A meaningful subject predicate sentence is meaningful only in virtue of its picking out some individual thing and ascribing some property to that thing. Okay. Um, the subject of this sentence, uh, the subject term, fails to pick out or denote anything that exists. Yeah. If one is meaningful only in virtue of picking out a thing and ascribing a property to that thing, uh, and if one subject term fails to pick out anything that exists, then either one is not meaningful after all, or one picks out a thing that does not exist. But there is no thing as a non-existent thing. Now, all of these individual points seem true, but they can't all be true, because all of them are they're inconsistent with one another. So that's the problem of reference to non-existence, right? How can a sentence, if I'm going to put this as simple as possible, how can a sentence, James Moriarty is bald, be meaningful if it refers to a non-existent thing? It can't have a truth value, or if it does, its truth value is negative, it's false. So how can it be meaningful? Frege would say, um, well, it's the reference that make, or not the reference, <laughs> Frege would say it's the sense that makes it meaningful. What about the problem of negative existentials? Well, uh, the problem of negative existentials is highlighted by a sentence like, Pegasus never existed. Okay, if that sentence is true, then it can't be about Pegasus, right? Because Pegasus never existed. So if it's true that Pegasus never existed, that sentence can't be about Pegasus, because it's not referring to anything that ever existed. You see what I'm saying? Now, if the statement is about Pegasus, it can't be true, because Pegasus never existed. So, how do we deal with this? Well, Frege deals with this problem by rejecting one of the premises we just looked at. Singular terms can be meaningful through their expression of a sense, and they need not refer, right? So, if we go back to the book, and we look at, uh, we look at J3, which applies to... Pegasus never existed, just as much as James Moriarty is bald. Uh, J3 reads, a meaningful subject predicate sentence is meaningful only in virtue of its picking out some individual thing and ascribing some property to that thing. Obviously, this doesn't pick out an individual thing because there is no individual thing that exists. Um, but that's fine. It need not refer according to Frege. We can um, get our meaning from this sentence's expression of a sense, and uh, the lack of a referent doesn't matter. Okay? Now what about the puzzle about identity, Frege's puzzle about identity? Um, so the puzzle about identity is kind of how Frege begins his paper, um, you know, A equals A and A equals B and the cognitive significance uh, 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 or difference in cognitive significance between statements like that. Uh, this needs to be worked out a little bit uh, in this problem. So if, um, you know, if, for example, Mary Ann Evans is George Eliot, or the author of the BFG is the author of Bitch. So um, these are, each sentence contains two singular terms, each of these sentences. Let's take Marianne Evans is uh, George Eliot. So these are two singular terms that refer to the same individual in the same sentence. So the statement uh, is identical, is that an individual is identical with herself. So it should be a trivial statement, but it doesn't seem like it's a trivial statement. In other words, it seems that the statement Mary Ann Evans is George Eliot is telling you something that you may not have already known. Same with the author of the BFG uh, is the author of Bitch. Um, this should, um, you know, even though these singular terms are different and they name the same individual, um, therefore logically this is trivial or tautological, it's not really to you when you hear the sentence uttered, right? Um, it seems like if you knew that, if you knew who Marianne's, Marianne Evans was, but you didn't know that she was also George Eliot, you would learn something new by hearing that Marianne Evans is George Eliot, even though um, both of those singular terms refer to the same individual. Do you see what I mean? So, um, this is a truth of meaning, not a truth of fact, right? Um, and the problem of substitute 
substi bleh, the problem of substitutivity, the final fourth problem, is related to this one. Um, expecting semantic equivalence, um, given that two terms refer to the same thing. Well, what can we say about that? Um, well, we should be able to substitute, if there is semantic equivalence, we should be able to substitute one, um, one of these terms for the other, right? We should be able to um, substitute singular terms that, reserve, uh, that refer to the same individual in a sentence um, and preserve the meaning or the truth value of the sentence. But the sentences, um, these sentences have a different cognitive significance to different people. I'll give you an example, okay? Um, so Superman is Clark Kent, right? This is, a, this is probably the textbook example of this kind of thing. So Superman is Clark Kent. All right, fine. So Clark Kent, Superman, those are two, uh, two names, two, um, two um, singular terms that refer to the same individual. So uh, I should be able to swap uh, Superman for Clark Kent um, in any sentence um, without uh, sacrificing you know, the truth value, without altering the truth value. So if I say, you know, um, Clark Kent is a journalist at the Daily Planet, at, you know, assume for argument's sake that there really is a Clark Kent and a Daily Planet and so on and so forth. So if I said that, uh, Superman is a, or if Clark Kent was a journalist at the Daily Planet, that would be true. Then I could substitute that term. Uh, I could substitute uh, Superman as a journalist at the Daily Planet. Wouldn't change the truth value of that sentence. Of course, this is a bit of a tricky example because, um, you know, Clark Kent, Superman, they have no reference. Um, but in any case, uh, the problem is highlighted when we talk about, um, you know, uh, swapping, these, uh, swapping these terms when we're referring to um, other people's beliefs. You know, that cognitive significance, uh, that's where that comes into the picture. So if I said to you, Lois Lane believes that Clark Kent is a journalist at the Daily Planet, well, that seems true. But Lois Lane doesn't know that Clark Kent is Superman's secret identity. So I can't substitute Clark Kent for Superman uh, in that sentence. I cannot then say Lois Lane believes that Superman is a journalist at the Daily Planet, right? That's um, a kind of referential opacity. Lois Lane does believe that Clark Kent is a journalist at the Daily Planet, but she does not believe that Superman is a journalist at the Daily Planet even though Superman and Clark Kent denote the same individual, namely Kal-El, last son of Krypton. Okay, now I realize I may have just gotten a little bit ahead of myself there, so I want to kind of reiterate why these are problems, and we'll tackle them in full when we finish this lecture and when we dive into chapters 2 and 3. The problem of apparent reference to non-existence, just in case it wasn't clear on the first pass, why is it a problem? Well, if a definite description is meaningful by virtue of that to which it refers, and there's nothing to which a particular definite description refers, there can be no meaning, right? But sentences like, Harry Potter thinks owls are neat, and Seymour Glass smiles enigmatically, um, don't seem meaningless. I mean, they they technically are. They would be meaningless if the referential theory of language were true. But that's why this is a problem. This is a puzzle, right? Um, in any case, remember, these are problems assuming you're looking at them from a referential theory of language or, uh, you know, along the lines of uh, what Mill uh, discusses. So, um... That's why the problem of apparent reference is a problem. What about the problem of negative existentials? Well, just in case it wasn't clear, if there isn't anything that um, a description can acquire meaning from, right, any expression affirming the non-existence of that thing will also be meaningless. This gets us back to the problem with a sentence like Pegasus never existed, right? Um, so, um, the problem of negatives uh, could... could um, the problem of negative existentials, if we take again one, one, one other quick pass over this sentence, 
uh, that I will mention, Pegasus never existed. Well, if that sentence is true, it can't be about Pegasus, and if it's about Pegasus, it can't be true. That is indeed if the referential theory of language is what you are adhering to, which by the end of these series of lectures, you probably won't be, so don't worry about it. Um, Frege's puzzle about identity. Well, I've already gone through this. Um, uh, I've already kind of gone through this. Uh, if there are two singular terms that refer to the same individual, um, well, um, the statement is then that the individual is identical with herself, right? Um, I could use this with the Superman example, right? Um, Clark Kent is Superman, so that's logically equivalent to saying Superman is Superman. So this should be a trivial statement, but it's not. If you were to, you know, if you were in the DC world or something and you said Lois Lane, hey, uh, you know, Clark over there is actually Superman, um, Lois would pick up some new information. So this is not trivial. So um, that's why that's a problem. Finally, the problem of substitutivity is related to this one. Um, it builds on the previous puzzle. Um, we expect that there's a semantic equivalence between two terms, two different terms that refer to the same thing, uh, but there isn't, there just isn't, right? And that's highlighted by, you know, comparing and contrasting statements like Lois Lane believes that Clark Kent is a journalist at the Daily Planet, and Lois Lane believes that Superman is a journalist at the Daily Planet. This referential opacity, as it's called, um, is created because of the difference between these propositional attitudes, uh, that is, attitudes towards propositions, whole sentences that say something about the world that can be true or false. Lois has a different attitude towards the proposition, Clark Kent is a journalist at the Daily Planet, than she does Superman is a journalist at the Daily Planet. Namely, she believes the first one to be true, and she believes the first sentence to be false, or she disbelieves the first sentence. Well, that takes us to slide 14, and that's where I want to call it quits for today, because this is pretty dense stuff. I should have your next lecture ready for, um, I'm hoping Sunday evening or Monday morning. Again, I apologize that I am behind with this. This has been very, very hectic. I imagine you're all feeling the pinch, too. So, uh, please bear with me, and thank you for your patience so far. I know some of you have reached out to me uh, with some concerns. I want you all not to worry. Don't panic. We're going to get through this. I'm not going to quiz you or ask you to do an assignment on anything that I have not lectured on. And I realize this material is dense and dry and difficult. So if you're not sure about anything, please do reach out to me. I want you all to do well in this class. I really do. And this is tough stuff. But once you come to understand it, it really does expand your mind a little bit, especially with regard to you know, fundamental questions like what the nature of language is and how meaning works and how we can connect our thoughts up to the world and to one another. So I'm really excited to be doing this. Uh, I know uh, very unfortunate circumstances led up to my teaching this class, and you're all no doubt very stressed out by the changes that are taking place, but don't worry. We will make it through the class together, and we will all learn something together too. So that's it for today. Again, reach out to me if you have any questions, um, and I will see you soon for our next lecture where we will finish talking about these problems and we'll cover the rest of Chapter 2 and Chapter 3 from the course textbook. All right, see you next time, everybody.